With the next general election only three years away, that is not really a long time to actually prepare. Like I say, it will probably come around a lot quicker than you even think about, or even more than you realise. It'll be here before you know it. But there are some big things, obviously, to think about. First of all, the Progressive Alliance, how it will work, how it will be formed, what policies are a Progressive Alliance going to propose to the country. That will be, again, something important and an important conversation to have if it happens. The big thing as well is what we are seeing not only boundary changes, but demographic changes as well. And these will really, really affect the next general election. And the, the boundary changes as well, specifically now, uh, we don't know, obviously, how uh, what effect they are going to take place at the moment. We know that um, you know, it's the public consultation has now started. And by the looks of it, my own constituency, Barnsley, looks to be getting three more MPs. Namely, I think Barnsley North, Barnsley South, and I can't remember what they're calling the other one. I can't remember. But essentially, Barnsley gets three new MPs. So that could be quite interesting. Uh, I think that probably does quite favour Labour well in the future. Like I say, Barnsley is, uh, has, has proven to be quite a strong uh, Labour stronghold. So we will have to see what happens. Like I say, when these boundary changes happen, it can be up in the air as to who knows what happens because it's all something new in play. And we don't know what factors could be in play at the next general election to swing them one way or the other. Who knows, like I say, but there is one thing we do know that will definitely affect the next general election, and that is demographics, because demographics are do love to play a huge part in British politics, and they are shifting. So, uh, before we do jump into the video, please do remember to hit that like, share, and subscribe button, and also down below there is links to my Patreon page, as well as a one off donation link called Buy Me Coffee, and also there is now the Pony Club down below, where you can just see that little join button next to the subscribe button. So, uh, on with today's article. And oh yes, thank you to everyone who does support me that way. So, this comes from the Yorkshire bylines. And the title is, The Demographic Shifts That Will Decide British Electoral Politics. In the aftermath of the local elections, the Labour Party's by-election defeat in Hartlepool, the party spent the following weekend self-flagellating that they had lost the trust of the working people. However, recent work has shown that this was far from the case. The data analysed by Ben Walker in The New Statesman has shown that exactly that exceeding the retired Labour, that, that, sorry, excluding the retired Labour vote, they won the popular vote of voters with an income of ten thousand uh, pounds, or sorry, sorry, a hundred thousand pounds or less in 2019. Also, analysis has been done of voters under uh, 55, showing that Labour was far more popular than the Conservatives in the lowest four quant quantities of 80 percent of British voters when divided by income. When the Conservatives storm ahead, however. It is, in the, it is in the over 55 age bracket, which they won in 2019, regardless of income. It is unlikely the picture was very much different in the local elections, and Labour's vote share in 2021, uh, totalling a 29%, was, a slap, uh, was a, the slap bang in the middle of its 2016 and 2017 results, and generally speaking, in line with the average year for Labour in the post-Brexit era. It is also, also seemingly the case uh, that this divide is an economic rather, in addition to, a cultural one based around wealth rather than income. The Ovish for National Statistics ONS data shows about 64% of households holds with main earners is 16 to 24 year olds have a household wealth of less than £20,000. Meanwhile, half of over 65 have a household wealth of over £500,000. This is still fundamentally, though, a class divide, and it is just uh, it is just that that is no longer matches or onto the nebulous, or unlikely British view of what class is. Education, upbringing, type of work are important, but those numbers show that the divide is far more about cold hard cash than our quantitative image of what working class would normally suggest. The problem 
is that with that, demographics, both in Britain and around the world, have historically been weighed to, weighted towards younger people as populations grew, both decreasing birth rates and increasing life expectancy. And this means the grey wall that's becoming more and more influential in British politics. And that population pyramid is gradually turning on its head, however. It is clear that a second force is now also coming to shape British politics, the growing number of people going to university. In 2019, Labour beat the Conservatives among graduates by 28 to 24 percent. Also in 2021, the Conservatives advanced at uh, most wards with the lowest population of graduates. As John Edling said on the Bylines Network podcast last week, this is not simply that the young are more liberal than the older, it is increasing that these generations have completely irredeemable, sorry, not, not uh, irre 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 I can't even say the word, uh, irreconcilable, that's how we say it, <laughs> economic interests. This leaves British politics divided between the two competing forces. On one hand, an aging population of retirees, which overwhelmingly votes Conservatives, and on the other, a vast growing number of graduates, generally speaking, liberalised in the university experience, who most likely vote for left of centre parties. So what is interesting is how this is so far elected on each party's electoral strategy. It's clear that Starmer is aware of the importance of the graduate vote, and most clearly in his decision making to keep the party's commitment to abolishing tuition fees. But he's also aware that growth lies in chipping away at the Great Wall. One of Starmer's main policy innovations so far was his new chapter for Britain, addressed by promising to make Britain the best country to be born and the best country to grow old in, and offering the idea of a British recovery bond. Aimed at savers, Starmer made a clear play to offer the, the, the positive, uh, positive vision to the elderly. The Conservative strategy here has been far, far more brutal. Rather than playing to both camps, the Conservative education strategy has been one clearly geared to decrease the number of people at university in an attempt to try and diminish this liberalising effect, while maintaining their lead with the elderly and retired. Gavin Williamson's post-16 skills, uh, skills bill was essentially marketed as a way to both offer an alternative un to university while allowing the Office of Students to crack down on low-value courses while decreasing the number of places at university. When paired with a planned 50% in cut funding to higher education, this legislation cannot help but have the effect, intended effect of intended or otherwise for decreasing university places. Indeed, as James Forsyth, the close confidant of Rishi Sunak, admitted as much in the Times this week. Similarly, the Higher Education and Freedom of Speech Bill seems targeted at making universities far less liberal. And this is by, done by preventing uh, by... Uh, for uh, being fired or no platforming for con controversial opinions. To see the Conservatives pitch for older, more affluent voters, one only needs to see the party's triple lock commitment to not raising income on income tax, national insurance or VAT. So it is impossible to know, however, which strategy will work in the long term, or even in, indeed, if either of them actually turn out to be wise, one could argue that the youth turnout vote will be well below of that retired, but increasing with each election. And there is market for growth in each appealing to the young. However, even in this group keeps on growing, demographics uh, mean that any successful opposition must be more competitive in the older age groups than Labour has been currently to date. Joe Biden was able to win in 2020 by both chipping away at America's grey wall and increasing youth turnout from 42% to 52%. For Keir Starmer to eliminate, uh, to emulate the president from whom he claims to draw so much inspiration, he needs to somehow pull off the same trick. And I completely 100% agree there. Starmer needs to do that. We are seeing demographics change, and if he can somehow chip away at the, the gray wall, as it's become to know, pull those conservatives over to the Labour side, while at the same time increasing the youth vote, because if we could, if we could emulate that, as 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 uh, as Biden did in America by increasing the youth vote of over ten percent, that could have huge, huge changes. We could see a lot of Labour MPs get elected 
if that happens. So potentially these demographic changes are quite important and they could have huge implications to Britain's electoral future. But how will they affect it? Well, we don't know. This is something where we're going to have to wait and see. So as always, thank you for watching. Please remember to hit that like, share and subscribe button. And also down below, remember there is my Patreon page, my One of the Nation link, Buy Me Coffee, where you can buy me coffee. And also as well, don't forget, there is now the Pony Club. So as is always, thank you very much to those people for supporting me that way. And as always, we'll see you all next time.